Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is a new colloquia, colloquium, sorry, for the uh, Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Professor Alessandro Marconi. He will talk about high risk ELT consortium instrument and science. Uh, Dr. Isabel Marquez will introduce uh, Alessandro Marconi. Isabel. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much, Rene. Thank, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for attending uh, this new Severo Choa uh, Colloquium at the IAA, which is in an online format, so the web locum uh, still. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Marconi, to be here uh, with us. Alessandro Marconi is full professor of astronomy and astrophysics at the Physics and Astronomy Department in the University of Florence in, in Italy. He obtained the master's degree in physics in uh, 1993 at the University of Florence and the PhD in astronomy in uh, 1998. In 1997, he got a permanent position as a researcher at the uh, Assetri Astrophysical Observatory. Uh, in November 2006, he became an uh, associate professor of astronomy and astrophysics, and in 2016, he got uh, his professorship. Uh, as, as for, uh, from uh, 2009 to 2014, he was appointed as the Italian representative at the Scientific and Technical Committee of the European Southern Observatory, the ESO, where he was chair from 2012 to 2014. His research interests go from supermassive black holes, active galactic nuclei and galaxy evolution, to the development of astronomical instruments. In fact, since 2015, he's the PI of the HIRIS project. Uh, and as you all know, HIRIS stands for High Resolution Spectrograph. HIRIS is a second phase uh, ELT instrument, which combines high resolution and wide uh, spectral range with a huge surface area of the ELT to produce data with exquisite detail and sensitivity. It is a pleasure for us to have today Professor Marconi to talk about the HIRIS ELT Consortium Instrument and Science. With no doubt, the high resolution data to be collected with HIRIS will, enables, uh, will enable us to research an unprecedented range of topics spanning most areas of astrophysics and even breaking into the domain of fundamental physics having uh, uh, the potential to greatly impact our understanding of the cosmos and its fate. Thank you very much, Professor Marconi. Um, I extend uh, the invitation for you to come in, uh, really come here in, in person to the IAA in the next future when possible, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, allowing me to present uh, Iris. Let me first uh, share my screen. Okay, so you should be seeing uh, uh, you should be seeing my screen. Okay, so again, I want to repeat and I want to thank you for allowing me uh, to present Iris and uh, thank you for your kind invitation to come to Granada. I hope uh, that when the situation will be back to normal, I will really be able to come. So first of all, uh, I. Uh, prepared a few slides of introduction to the ELT and uh, the instrumentation program on the ELT just to set, uh, to set the stage. But before of that, I, I must say that what I'm presenting here is the work done by a large consortium. And so it is uh, fitting that first of all, I introduce you to the highest consortium, to the institutes and people who are uh, uh, making, who are, um, with my computer, okay. Okay, so the IRIS Consortium is made basically of more than 30 institutes from uh, 13 countries. Here in this uh, slide, uh, you will see the names uh, of the institutes which are involved in the various countries and uh, the name of the people uh, that are the contact point, I would say, for, for each country. In Spain, we have the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias, the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia, El Centro de Astrobiología de Madrid. Uh, so your institute is part of the IRIS Consortium and the person 
who's involved in IRIS, so who's leading the effort in IRIS in, uh, in your institute is Pedro Amado, which of course you all know. So just uh, uh, a couple of notes that we have uh, since uh, the beginning of the projects, uh, we have two new partners, which are the University of Montreal in Canada and the University of Michigan in the USA. And uh, the other is uh, Italy, the Italian National Astrophysics of Italy is the lead technical institute of the consortium. So just a quick uh, introduction on the uh, ELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope, which is going to be the largest uh, optical infrared telescope in the world. It has a 39 meter segmented primary mirror. And you can see in this cartoon, in the, you can see my pointer, correct? Yes, yes, we can see it. Yeah, so in this cartoon, you can see a comparison of the existing large telescopes with uh, which are the forthcoming uh, uh, extremely large telescope, like the 30 meter telescope, the giant Magellan telescope, and then the ELT, the European Extremely Large Telescope, which is made of uh, many segments of about one meter each. But as you can see, it will be a huge increment in size with respect to the existing telescope. One of the characteristics of the ELT is that it will be a fully adaptive optic assisted telescope, meaning that to work, it will have to have an adaptive optic system working. Even the so-called scene limited mode of the ELT will have a ground layer adaptive optic correction. So it will not be a real scene limited mode. Now the ELT will be placed in Chile on the Cerro Paranal, uh, oh, sorry, on the Cerro Amazones, and uh, which is a, a hill, a mountain, about 20 kilometers from the Cerro Paranal, where the existing uh, te telescopes, uh, UT telescopes, ISO telescope are. So the ELT will be part basically of the Paranal Observatory. Now the construction of the ELT started in 2015. The first technical light is expected for the end of 2025, but uh, I'm afraid that there will be uh, some delays due to the current uh, COVID emergency. I still, I don't even know if ISO at this point can estimate if and what size of will be the delays due to the emergency. Now, uh, the important thing to set the stage for IRES is to talk about the instruments. And before doing that, I would like to point you out to the new web page that ISO has developed on the ELT, very simple, elt.iso.org, nice web page with a lot of information. And the slides I'm showing here were obtained from that web page. So what, are the, what is the instrument plan for the ELT? Basically, there, are, there is a set of at least seven instruments, which these are the first uh, generation instruments, which are foreseen and already uh, started, uh, uh, some of them already started construction. The first instrument is uh, Mikado, which is basically an imager with a coronagraph, high resolution imager, and uh, it has also a single slit capability. The PI is Rick Davis from Max Planck, uh, for extraterrestrial physique in Germany. And then there is uh, Maori, which is basically the adaptive optic system, which is going to work together with Mikado. And uh, this uh, instrument, the API is Paolo Ciliegi from ENAF in Italy. Then we have the integral field unit, which is Harmony. And uh, the API of this instrument is Niranjan Tate from the University of Oxford. And, and then we have, uh, for the first set of instruments, METIS, which is the mid-infrared instrument, which is going to have an imager, a single slit, and IFU capabilities. And the PI is Bernard Brandl from Leiden in the Netherlands. These are the first light instruments, meaning that this is the set of instruments which is supposed to arrive at the telescope close to first light within a couple of years for first light. Then we have uh, IRES, for which I am the PI. It is basically a, a high resolution spectrograph so with uh, some capabilities, which I will explain to you. And then Mosaic, which is the multi-object spectrograph and the PI is Lydia Tasca from uh, LAM Marseille. 
and both instruments have finished phase A and are waiting to start uh, uh, construction. Hopefully this will happen by the end of this year of the beginning of next year. And then we have the planetary camera for survey, which is a system with extremely adaptive optics. And this is just uh, the aim, the main aim of this instrument is the study of Earth-like exoplanet, take images of Earth-like exoplanet and do spectroscopy. However, this instrument is, uh, um, has a lot of R&D of research and development needed. So it is not yet, its characteristics and time scales are not yet defined. Sorry for this. Uh, okay, so what are the, in summary, the characteristic of this instrument? Here you can see what are the wavelength coverage in imaging of Mikado and Metis and then the spectroscopic resolving power and wavelength range of the other instruments. And you can see that IRIS basically plants would like to cover uh, at a high resolution at over 100,000 from the blue to the, to the K band. Here is again another uh, plot which shows the uh, field of view of this instrument and the spatial resolution. You can see that IRIS has a very high spatial spectral, sorry, uh, 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 seeing limited spatial resolution. As I told you before, you can see this is the regime of the seeing limited mode of the ELT. But as I told you, uh, this, this is not real seeing limited like in a normal telescope, but it has a, a ground layer adaptive optic correction because otherwise the, the telescope will not work. Uh, here, what we have missing is also the high uh, spatial resolution diffraction limited mode of iris, or which of course I will tell you, I will tell you in a moment. Now, the ELT is supposed to start at the end of 2025, so it will have over uh, 20 or more years of operation. So let's just see briefly what are the uh, observatories which will be uh, which will come online in in similar periods. This slide is probably not very much updated, but uh, you can see that. Uh, ELT will be able to operate together with SKA and then the satellites like Plato, Euclid and Athena, but also with uh, JWST, at least the, the last years of operation of JWST. And of course, uh, uh, LST and but uh, the VLT and ALMA, because let's not forget that uh, ELT will be uh, just one telescope with a huge pressure but uh, the VLT will still be operating at uh, a very high quality, uh, in, with a very high quality instrumentation. So it will be very well in use uh, together to complement uh, the ELT. Now, what are the competitors of the instrumentations of the ELT? Here is a table, I won't enter into the details, but here is the table showing uh, the, uh, capa the observational capabilities. Uh, basically whether you have uh, the wavelength range, uh, presence of adaptive optics, IFU or imaging and so on. Here are the corresponding instruments which share this capability for the GMT, the TMT and the ELT. And in the case of IRIS, the competitors of IRIS uh, for what concerns the high resolution spectroscopy, both seeing limited and uh, uh, adaptive optic assisted are these instruments uh, uh, nearest and HROS for the TMT and GCLEF and GMT and IRS for the, for the GMT. So that was uh, very briefly my introduction to set the stage for IRES. Uh, I, if you want to know more about the ELT instrumentation plan, uh, I suggest you that you go through the ELT uh, ISO web page. It is a nice web page. It has some content also, and it has a section which is dedicated to the instruments from where I took the slide that I showed you. Now, let's start by introducing what is the context, the broad context where IRIS started and why we have an IRIS project. First of all, as, as I told you, 
the European Extremely Large Telescope will be the largest ground-based telescope at visible and infrared wavelengths. And the two flagship science cases of the ELT are the detection of like signatures in Earth-like exoplanets and the direct detection of the cosmic acceleration. And both cases are cases which requires high resolution spectroscopy. So you see that the existence of iris for the ELT is quite important. Moreover, what can we say about high resolution spectroscopy? As Isabel said in the introduction, iris high resolution spectroscopy is highly interdisciplinary because it can go from exoplanets to cosmology and fundamental physics. But in Europe and in the ESO member states in particular, it builds on a very successful ESO tradition, which builds on instrument which you probably know very well, like UVES, Friars, Flames, X Shooter, uh, not to uh, forget about Espresso, which is the last instrument to came online and to which Spain gave, uh, gave a large contribution. And this is translated into the fact that more than 30% of these publications can be attributed to the high resolution spectrographs. Then if you want to think about it, uh, we have also the fact that uh, at eight meters with high resolution spectroscopy, we are really into the photon star regime and going to 40 meter telescope will probably provide a sort of a quantum leap for high resolution spectroscopy. So now this is the background where Iris was born and uh, Iris is basically the merging of two previous projects that are Codex and Simple that were concept studied for the, in, at the first stages of the ELT, of the building of the ELT uh, proposal, construct, construction proposal. And these two Codex and Simple were two, one optical and one infrared spectrograph which were merged uh, in the concept of a single spectrograph, which is able to provide a very high spectral resolution in a very wide simultaneous wavelength range. Now, we already mm, performed, conducted successfully a phase A study, which was completed in uh, 2018, and we are now starting to, uh, waiting to start, uh, uh, to start construction. So, uh, IRES can, as a high resolution spectrograph can address a well, a huge number of very important and exciting science cases, which goes from exoplanets and protoplanetary disks to the study of stars and stellar population to the intergalactic medium galaxy evolution up down to the fundamental physics. I won't enter into the details of all these science cases, but uh, uh, just to, to see the wealth of the, this, the amount of science cases which are possible with an instrument like IRES, I would point out to, to this white paper, which is now old, needs to be updated, but just gives you an idea on how many things you can, you can do with an instrument like IRES. What I want to do now is just to focus on, few, on a few representative science cases. The first of the important science cases for IRES is the study of the atmosphere of uh, uh, exoplanets and uh, the, with the possibility of detecting the signatures of life. Here you have uh, this uh, spectrum is uh, a, actually a transmission spectrum of the Earth atmosphere, which is uh, from a nature paper by Henrik Pallier. Uh, in uh, 2008, I think. And uh, this was obtained by taking uh, the spectrum of the stars, uh, of the light from Earth reflected by the moon during the eclipse. So you could get uh, uh, this uh, uh, transmission spectrum, which could simulate what you get from, uh, from an ex Earth-like exoplanet. However, this is a, a very a infinite signal to noise we compare to what you would expect to get with, uh, which is possible to get nowadays, even with a 40 meter telescope. And the idea of this science case is to detect the so-called biosignatures, which are molecular oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, and methane. And I would like to stress that it is important to detect all of these elements, all of these molecules, because 
but studying the uh, relative abundances of these molecules is the way that you can say that the atmospheres is outside of equilibrium and that you need uh, life forms like the plants to put to keep the atmosphere out of equilibrium because each single molecule by itself could be easily could be produced by normal physical processes for instance molecular oxygen could come from the uh, photo dissociation of water or uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere due to the uv photons from the star but that would not mean that you have uh, just by detecting the two of them, that would not mean that you have a, a plant. So you need uh, basically to detect all of them and especially measure the rare, their relative abundances. Now, how can you study the exoplanet atmospheres? You basically use uh, high resolution spectroscopy to disentangle the plan, the signature from the planet atmosphere and the stellar spectra. You can do it uh, like in the bottom part here uh, just by studying the uh, light from the star which is which passes through the atmosphere of the exoplanet this is called the the study in transmission or by studying the light of the star reflected by the exoplanet now to give you an idea of an instrument or what an instrument like iris with the ELT could do you could do the planets in the trappist one in the trappist system the two earth like earth like exoplanets in the trappist system uh, in, in in a relatively short time you could detect water in two transits of the planets and two or four transits of the planets co2 in five transit and uh, oxygen in 25 transit and this is the uh, signal that we get for for instance for the detection of oxygen in uh, 70 hours of observation of the uh, Proxima B uh, planet, which is the closest uh, Earth-like planets uh, currently, currently known. Now, this is a, a bit, this slide is a bit complicated uh, just to show that uh, um, this is not going to be easy to detect this uh, signature, this biosignature in uh, exoplanets. And uh, for instance, if you look uh, at uh, these uh, plots on the left, uh, you can clearly understand that if you just take the spectrum of the stars, you have no hope to see the signature of these of the exoplanets because the signature of the exoplanets is uh, of the order of a few parts per million. Just com consider uh, what is the fraction of the disk of the stars, which is covered by the atmosphere of the planet in transmission. And then you can understand that the signal is very small. However, the signal is even is due by uh, to many uh, thousands of lines. So what you do to detect the signature of the exoplanet is do a cross correlation of the stellar spectrum when the planet is in transmission, when the planet is uh, uh, passing between us and the stars and you cross correlate the spectrum with the, with the theoretical spectrum of uh, expected transmission. And of course, if uh, the two spec, the, the theoretical spectrum is a good description of the uh, transmission spectrum of the exoplanet, uh, you get a cross correlation signal uh, because uh, this cross correlation signal basically um, combines together all the lines that are in the spectrum. So why you don't see the single line, you can see all of them and see the signal. So this is what, what is this cross correlation signal. And this is a, a study, a recent study by Oker and Perry, but there are many papers around of, about this technique. Now, uh, going from exoplanets to extragalactic astronomy, uh, one other goal of uh, IRIS is the uh, study of the chemical enrichment of the universe, especially the one due to pop three stars. And uh, the way we are doing it is by doing a spectroscopy of quasars and using them as uh, beacons to uh, illuminate the clouds, the intergalactic clouds that are between us and the quasar. So what we will see are absorption lines in the quasar spectrum due to star to clouds which are uh, along the line of sight. Now, why is this important? What we hope to do? What we hope to do is to detect the imprint, the chemical imprint of the uh, pop three stars. Uh, you know that uh, when you have a, an explosion of the 
top three supernova, there is a pollution of the elements produced within the, the top three stars, and these uh, elements are uh, have a very uh, peculiar uh, chemical uh, um, imprint, which can be detected. And here just to is a simulation of what IS can do, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Here you can see in uh, black, uh, you have the uh, expectant absorption spectrum of uh, a redshift seven quasar with uh, an HAB magnitude of 20 observed for just uh, two hours. And in black is the simulated spectrum if uh, you are detecting a medium which, is, which has been enriched by a normal type two supernova. Uh, however, if you have a medium which has been enriched by a pop three low mass progenitor supernova, then let's say lower than 40 uh, solar masses, you would get deeper silicon to a carbon two lines and you will get an even different signature if you have a medium enriched by pair instability supernova that are those produced by very massive uh, pop three stars over a hundred or more uh, mass solar masses. So you can clearly see that uh, you can distinguish clearly with iris uh, between these three cases. So you, you can get, you can find the signature of a pop three supernova. This is for a redshift seven quasar, and this is for a redshift nine quasar uh, with a longer integration time, but an integration time which is still more than feasible. You can able to clearly able to detect these three different cases. Now, uh, here is another simulation of what you expect from Iris installing the uh, IGM. I'm showing these uh, two. Uh, present uh, what is the difference between what you can currently do with the X shooter at the VLP. <clears throat> Here you have a, a simulation, which of course is uh, close to what to the reality of what you get with X shooter in 25 hours of VLP time by studying this uh, uh, system with uh, a, a oxygen, carbon, and silicon absorption. This is the uh, model spectrum. This is the simulated spectrum. Here is a, we have a, a system with 10 to the minus three uh, solar abundances. And this quasar is again, uh, redshift seven and JAB of 20. Basically you see that with each shooter, you, you don't detect, uh, almost, you barely detect the, 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 the deepest, the, the, the deepest, the strongest line. However, with Iris in only five hours, you not only have, of course, a higher spectral resolution, but you have a much better signal to noise. So it's clear that you are able to measure all these absorption lines and so study the characteristics of this medium. Now, another science case which you can address, it, has, it is related to fundamental physics and in particular, the study, uh, the search for the variation of the fundamental physical constants. Here is a simulation for the uh, variation of the fine structure constants. And this is what you can do with the uh, iris compared to what you can do at the moment with the uh, VLP Espresso. I think this is still to be uh, verified with the current performances of Espresso, but still with ELT, you, you will be able to constrain uh, the variation of the fundamental, uh, the fine, sorry, the fine structure constant to better than one part over a million. Finally, the last case, uh, which I want to present you is the so-called Sandach test, the redshift drift. In principle, it is very simple. It's an idea of Alan Sandage. And basically the idea is uh, since the universe is accelerating uh, in time, uh, if you observe a source at different times, you will see a variation of the, um, of the recession velocity, the so-called redshift drifts, because uh, of course uh, the, the source is emitting, uh, is emitting the photons uh, uh, when the universe has different scale factors. So this results in different redshifts. And so you can measure the acceleration of the uh, growth of the of deceleration of the growth of the scale factor. 
Here is uh, uh, what you expect. Here is the redshift drift, that is the redshift variation as a function of the redshift of the source. You see that you have clearly different signatures according to the different cosmology. But what I would like you to uh, see are the units here. The units are a variation of the redshift at the level of a centimeters per second per year. So this is a very tiny, tiny values. However, even if these values are tiny, these are doable uh, with a program which will uh, uh, use more or less 4,000 hours of observation spread over, over 20 years. And uh, this is uh, uh, what you expect, uh, these are the signals that you expect to measure these uh, points with error bars uh, by using uh, uh, different uh, sam samples with different sizes at different redshifts. And this clearly show you that you are able to uh, basically constrain uh, omega matter and omega lambda. And I want to stress uh, two things. First of all, that regardless of the cosmological models that you are seeing, you are able to measure the deceleration of the scale factor. You are able to verify directly that the scale factor that is the redshift value varies as you expect. And moreover, you can, if you assume the standard uh, cosmological model, you can measure omega matter and omega lambda independently of the standard candles you are using you know that there are still the possible doubts on the fact that the existence of a cosmological constant of an omega lambda be due to the fact that the standard candles that are the supernova type 1a do not really behave well. So this will not be an issue with, with, with standard test. Now, uh, of course, you will have noticed that this is a very long-term program, 20 years with a lot of time. But uh, of course, uh, this is a legacy program. What, what does it mean? It means that uh, the quasars you are observing for this program, the observation that you are getting for these programs are not observation which are just aimed at using the standard test, but are observation which you, with which you can do the study of the intergalactic medium to search for pop three stars. You can study the variation of the physical constant and so on. So this is just a legacy program which can use data of quasars obtained for other reasons. Now, these are just a few of the science cases. As I told you, there are many other exciting science cases which are possible. And if you consider all the possibilities that are open with an instrument of this kind, it turns out that uh, you basically need, uh, of course, uh, uh, as a science requirement for the many science cases, this uh, spectral resolution of about 100,000 with a simultaneous wide wavelength range, which can go from 0.3 microns to 2.4 and many different observing modes. First of all, is it possible to obtain this with an instrument? Yes, it is possible with a fiber fed a shell spectrograph like the one shown here. I won't enter into the details now because I will talk uh, uh, better, explain this later. But basically, you, this instrument is composed of a front end, which is basically takes the light from the telescope, then a fiber link, which is where all the fibers uh, get the light from the front end and brings the, fine, the, the light to the spectral arms, to the different spectral arms. Just uh, a, a disclosure, this is the old architecture which came out of phase A. I will show you the new one in a moment. But the point here is that an instrument like this would be extremely expensive, over 50 million euro of hardware only. I mean, all the EL3 instrument, as you probably know, will be very expensive because will be very large and will be complex. But I mean, uh, doing a high resolution spectrograph, which covers the uh, top level requirements, which are outlined above is very, very expensive. 
And uh, since the resources are not unlimited, we had to do a prioritization of uh, the science requirements. And I must say that I think that the prioritization which is, was made by a science group was a very, in my opinion, was a very nice job. It worked uh, this way. So the idea is the following. Uh, the science team uh, selected the, the first priority. And uh, with the unanimous agreement of all the members of all the working groups, uh, the science first priority is the, exo the study of exoplanet atmosphere via transmission spectroscopy, the one that I showed you. And uh, this is uh, as the potential of uh, uh, detecting biosignature, which will have uh, a huge amount of implications, not only in science, but also beyond uh, astronomy, physics, and beyond science itself. So if you want to do this study, to be able to study exoplanet atmosphere using transmission spectroscopy, you basically need these, among others, these top level requirements. Basically resolution larger than 100,000, this is simultaneous spectral range, and so on. These are those which will drive the baseline design. Now, how the prioritization went from this? Well, uh, we considered all the science cases which were made possible by these top level requirements by saying, if I have an instrument which can study these exoplanet atmosphere in transmission spectroscopy, what other science cases can do? Many interesting others like the study of the ionization of the universe, the uh, intergalactic medium, the study of cool stars, and so on. So all the science cases which were made possible were removed from the prioritization, were not considered in prioritization because there was no need to prioritize them. They were already associated with this science case. Then we move on to priority two. And priority two is the variation of the fundamental constant of physics because this prioritization allows, requires basically an extension to the blue. And by doing this extension to the blue with this top level requirement from the first case, we have a lot of other science cases that we can do. Uh, cosmic variation of the CMB temperature, the theorem abundance, uh, very old stars, the primitive stars, and so on. Third priority, exoplanet atmosphere with reflection spectroscopy. Again, same uh, aim as the first priority. And this priority requires the capability that the instrument is capable of uh, uh, having an integral field unit, a IFU capability, and uh, an adaptive optic system. Again, this allows other science cases. I don't know, study of planet formation in protoplanetary disks, uh, characterization of stellar atmospheres, the low mass black hole in galaxy nuclei, and so on. Finally, last priority, the redshift drift, which requires uh, a, a very high accuracy and stability down to the level of two centimeters per second in, in spectroscopy. So these are the four priorities, but by showing these four priority, what I'm saying is that I have an instrument which is able to address a large majority of the science cases which were studied, which were thought. So with these science priorities, these are the, this is the uh, actual architectural design of the instrument that came out you see that we have uh, two observing modes, the seeing limited mode from which we have uh, fibers which connect to the, to, the, to the spectrographs. The spectrographs are uh, basically three, uh, a blue, uh, visible, uh, a green, visible, and near infrared one. And then there is also the goal of extending the instrument to the K band and to the blue. Uh, and uh, again, these uh, uh, spectrographs are fed with different fiber bundles uh, because of uh, the, as I will explain in a moment, the observing mode is set by the fibers. So again, these are the main, uh, the main components of the spectrograph. Now, 
what the, again, let, let's focus a bit on this uh, fiber feeding. I think that the fiber feeding is a nice uh, feature of the, of the instrument because basically it allows the selection of the observing mode uh, with a different fiber feeding, with a different bundle of fiber. So if I want to, to make a specific observing mode, I have a bundle of fiber. If I want to have a different observing mode, I will have a different bundle of fibers to feed the spectrogram. This allows not to have any moving parts in the spectrogram. So this is important, fundamental for the stability and of the, of the spectrum, if, if you don't have any moving parts. And here is a, an architectural design of uh, the observing mode. Again, the scene limited from end, you have uh, two different uh, observing mode in scene limited, a high accuracy mode and a high throughput mode. And of course, you have a different uh, uh, fiber to fiber interfaces and interfaces with the, with the spectrograph. And also you have here the, um, the uh, diffraction limited mode with a, a single conjugated adaptive optic and IFU uh, and the integral field unit and which feeds the near infrared spectrograph. So here is uh, uh, what I mean by getting different uh, observing mode, different uh, um, fiber bundles. Uh, I would like to stress that uh, uh, we are IL, that is imagination limited in the observing mode. So you can think of a, a way to arrange the fibers and define a different observing mode. So here are just two examples of a high throughput seeing limited observing mode, high accuracy seeing limited observing mode. Of course, in high throughput, you try to focus the light in, in, in the central parts of the slit. In the high accuracy uh, observing mode, you, um, you high to try to focus a, to have a uniform distribution along the spectrometer. So these are the scene limited cases. That is, this bundle of fibers are just like buckets to collect the light uh, from the telescope. If you put in an uh, adaptive optic system, you instead of having this blurred uh, image of the stars of your source, you have a diffraction limited image. And then you can use the different uh, fibers to, to have for different SPAC cells to, to have a special, basically a special information. Uh, and so you have a small, uh, high resolution integral field unit, which I mean, don't be fooled by the fact that it is small, but consider that it is unique in the sense that it has a high spectral resolution, 100,000, and a simultaneous wide spectral range, 1 and 1.8 microns. Of course, uh, we are limited by the size of the detectors, by the number of pixels available. So since we are having a very high spectral resolution and a certain um, field of view, then the number of spaxel is uh, by uh, necessity small because we, we need to conserve the total number of pixels on the detectors where the light is uh, diffused. Now, one point that I would like to tell you about is the possible extension of the instrument to uh, the very blue. Uh, this is very important for many science cases from stars to uh, study of the intergalactic medium. And uh, this extension is uh, really easy, possible for, uh, for the, for, with the current design. However, there is a problem with the telescope because uh, you, I don't know if you know that the coating of the ELT is uh, silver. And this silver, the reflection of the silver below basically 0.4 microns drops dramatically. Uh, so basically uh, what happens, you see that from this uh, exposure time calculator, you see that below 0 0.5, 0 0.4 micron, the sensitivity of the instrument drops dramatically. And this is due to the telescope. So we still have to assess whether the combination of LT iris can be more sensitive in the blue than DLT uh, plus espresso. However, the possibility of having this blue extension is very important 
because uh, otherwise, uh, uh, basically, the ELT would not have any blue spectroscopic capability in contrast with the other, with the other uh, telescopes. Uh, but uh, ESO is developing uh, a, an improved uh, blue, sensitive, blue sensitive silver coating, uh, which should be available uh, several years after first light. So it's important that we are able to, to go down to the blue. Now, here is a, a simulation a result from the end-to-end -end simulator which was prepared in phase A. So here is a simulated spectrum expected from iris on the detector. You have basically here the spectra of two sources obtained by with two different apertures. That is the bundle of fibers is divided in two parts and they are uh, located on two different objects. And then you can see that uh, uh, at the borders, you have these uh, uh, spectra from the Fabry Perot. And here are the extracted spectra, the Fabry Perot spectrum, which is important for wavelength uh, calibration, and then the, the science, the spectrum of the science, uh, of the science source. Now, uh, there is a nice thing to say about this end-to-end -end simulator. This end-to-end -end simulator, of course, uh, requires a lot of computing power. So at the beginning, there was the, um, the question of whether to buy a cluster or computer, powerful computer just to, for the end-to-end -end simulator or, or not. Since it was just a phase A study, it was decided to use the cloud computing with Amazon. And uh, this thing was then, Amazon then asked uh, to, uh, to present the case and uh, they did a press release on uh, how the uh, ENAF, the Italian Institute for Astrophysics is using uh, Amazon web cloud services to search, uh, to study the universe. And there is also this nice uh, 30 second YouTube video that they did just to show that how these things can have uh, some impact uh, also on in uh, uh, beyond beyond astronomy. Now, here is a, a, a rendering, a very simple rendering of the uh, iris. Uh, it will be uh, part of the tele. This is the NASMIT platform of the ELT. Part of the instrument uh, will be in the NASMIT platform, and part of the instrument will be in the CUDE room. Uh, why, for instance, the visible spectrograph uh, will be in the on the NASMIT, why the infrared in the CUDE room? This depends on the fibers. Basically, we, with a near infrared spectrograph, you can just use normal telecom fibers uh, to bring the light down to the CUDE room. You can have fibers with uh, several hundred meters of length, uh, which are not losing light. While in the visible and in the blue, you have you are limited in the length of fiber. So this is why the, the visible spectrograph has to stay on the NASMIT platform. So this is just uh, the explanation. So in the CUDE room, you have also electronic racks and, uh, and the calibration unit. So what is a summary of the capabilities of IRES? It's a modular fiber thread across dispersed spectrograph with three ultra stable spectral arms, which are capable to provide a simultaneous spectral range between 0.4 and 1.8 microns. It provides a spectral resolution of at least 100,000, but if you take smaller fibers, you can also get to very high spectral resolution like 150,000. It is it can operate in, with many different observing modes. And in particular, it can operate in the so-called seeing limited mode of the ELT, and also in a diffraction limited mode with an integral field unit. It is possible to add a spectropolarimetric capability, even if this is still uh, to be defined because uh, the ELT has five mirrors, so many reflections, and these are not good for spectropolarimetry. So we would need to get the light uh, at the focus and one of the intermediate focus of the ELT, but that's difficult. It's not possible to access that because of uh, uh, the sensitivity and the, the, uh, the instrument, but this is still to be defined. So the baseline, which I showed you, is basically uh, capable of uh, fulfilling the uh, requirements of the four 
top science cases plus many more additional science cases. And I would like to stress that the capability of virus of observing scene limited is extremely important and it can deliver even suppose that the ELT is not working well in adaptive optics, still iris can work and deliver uh, cutting edge science. For instance, just consider that uh, the spectroscopy of the exoplanet is transmission does not require the diffraction limit performance because it, you just have to collect the light from the stars. So uh, the project is complex. We have a, a consortium organization which is uh, complex by itself. And uh, I won't enter into the details because also this organization is still uh, a work in progress. We are just trying to finalize the organization for the construction phase before the end of the uh, construction phase uh, itself. So just uh, uh, cost something about costs, uh, guaranteed time of observation and schedule. The uh, total estimated cost of the baseline design I've shown you is about 35 million euros in cash for the hardware. And plus you need uh, an, uh, about uh, more than 50, 55, um, sorry, 550 FTEs uh, during the, uh, the whole duration of the construction period. This is a, a large uh, amount of resources which is required for the instrument. And this will be compensated by ISO by with about 125 GTO nights, times of guaranteed uh, obser observing times, which will be used for joint uh, consortium science programs. That is, uh, we will use these programs, all the consortium uh, together. What about the schedule? Well, phase A was completed already a couple of years, three years ago. Uh, we hope to start uh, the preliminary design phase, the phase B, uh, by the end of the year, of beginning of next year. And considering uh, these duration for preliminary design, final design, and then construction and integration, we could be to the telescope as early as 2029 or 2030. So this is the time frame over which you expect Iris to be at the telescope, of course, provided that there is a, a telescope itself. So I'm finished. I hope I've not taken too much time. Just a quick summary of the characteristic of the Iris projects. It's a big, very large consortium more than 30 institutes, 13 countries. And just to give you an idea, over 200 people contributed to the phase A study. So this is the number of people which are expected to work on IRIS in, uh, if not more, during construction. Uh, we hope to be at the telescope as early as 2029, 2030. And we will be able with the GTO nights, which are awarded to us to address uh, many uh, exciting science cases, which goes from the biomarkers in exoplanet atmosphere to the fundamental constant of physics or the sun ledge effect. So the simultaneous range of the spectrograph at the moment, the baseline is uh, between 0.4 and 1.8 micron, but we could extend it down to 0.35 or 2.4 microns. Again, simultaneous spectral range with a spectral resolution of 100,000. Uh, finally, the uh, observing modes are two, seeing limited and uh, adaptive optic assisted, that is diffraction limit with an integral field unit. And overall, uh, the resources required are about 35 million euros in hardware and over a few hundred, uh, 550 uh, FTEs. I would say conclude with this characteristic of, the, of this instrument. It is technically simple. It's not simple at all, but it is simple as ELT instrument. It is the simplest technically of all the ELT instrument. It is almost independent of the pupil of the telescope. That is, it can work, as I said, seeing limited or adaptive optic. It has great science cases and it is modular. 
meaning that even if we don't have enough resources to build all the modules, we can build some of them, we can descope in a non-destructive way. And if we get the money later, we can build the rest of the instrument. And I think this is all. Uh, this is my email if you want to contact me to know more about IRS and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for this very nice talk. And then the talk is open for questions. For all the participants, please raise your hand. For doing that, from doing that, press the reaction button and then you will find there the uh, rising hand. Uh, Pedro Amado, who, which is the person that invited uh, Alessandro, will manage the uh, question and answer session. Pedro, please. Okay, yeah, thanks, Rene. Uh, thanks, Alessandro, for a very uh, nice uh, summary of uh, ELT instrumentation and, and the high risk uh, consortium uh, and project. Uh, we already have questions, so uh, we are not going to spend uh, time and we are going to go directly to the first question by Elier. Elier, um, if you can hear me, yeah? Yes. Okay, you, you can go ahead with your question. Hi, Alessandro. First of all, uh, thank you for this really great thank you. Uh, presentation. First, first two comments. So I'm really glad to see that uh, the consortium has the priorities right and exoplanet atmosphere is number one. It's really good to see. And second of all, it's really good to see that at least the the, the warm part is going to be right, uh, right on the NASMIT platform because I think this is this has been some somewhat a bit of a uh, Achilles heel for Espresso uh, going going through so many Kudai tunnels. My question was um, with regards to when 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 you were talking about biomarkers and one of them being O2, there has been uh, the, there has been some papers recently saying uh, showing that in in order to pull out atmospheric lines uh, of or two from the, from the exoplanet atmosphere in in CCF, in order to be able to separate them from from telluric lines, we need uh, a resolving power somewhere between two to three hundred thousand. Are you envisaging maybe possibly uh, adopting the, the the front end to in to maybe increase the resolution a, a little bit more? Okay, uh, at the moment uh, with the current design, it is not possible. Uh, what we can do is uh, by taking smaller fibers uh, to get to a resolution of 150,000. That's the maximum we can get with the current design. Now, again, you know that in phase B, many things can happen. If we uh, get uh, the input from the uh, science team that we need to increase the spectral resolution, then we will think about it. Because indeed, uh, the, uh, science the science case on the exoplanet is extremely important. I mean, everyone agrees, even myself, who are not uh, an exoplanet scientist, I work in uh, actigalactic nuclei, but still I think uh, I'm very excited uh, about this. Just to tell you, I, uh, we have a, a researcher here in Florence who work on exoplanet atmosphere, and I told, uh, I, I told him, you got yourself a new student, me. I want to start okay. doing something on exoplanets and learn about this. So it's very important. I know. And if uh, it turns out that this is uh, the, the case, and uh, we'll, of course, uh, evaluate this possibility. OK, great. Thank you. Of course, uh, again, uh, we have a limited amount of resources. Uh, this is not uh, an instrument which should be focused on a single science case. This is going to be a facility instrument at the ELT. So if going to 200 uh, case uh, resolution means just focusing on exoplanets on, and a couple of other science cases, so I don't think that uh, it will be possible. At, I don't think that ESO themselves will, will allow it because this is a, is a facility instrument. So it should uh, be there for many, many science cases. Of course. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Elia, for your question. Um, uh, I myself would like to ask a question to Alessandro, uh, not to miss this opportunity. Um, uh, as you all know, the IEA, uh, he has shown it, uh, this in his uh, presentation, has contributed to, or is contributing to HIRES, 
uh, we, we finished um, the phase A and um, well, we are some of us here at the IEA participating in the project. Um, after such a nice presentation um, and uh, after seeing the possibilities uh, of, uh, of the science that uh, high risk can carry out, uh, many, maybe some of our researchers here at the AEA would be interested in, in participating or contributing more actively to the, to, to the high risk uh, consortium. Alessandro, can you tell us what would be the way to um, channel uh, participation, contribution from the science point of view of researchers, uh, for instance, at, at any institution in general, but in particular at the AEA, if they were interested in, in contributing okay. actively? Okay, for the science, uh, the science team will be composed, uh, I guess, of about 100 people. This will be divided into four working groups. That is a working group of uh, exoplanets and uh, star formation. Then there is a working group on stars. Then there is a working group on uh, extragalactic astronomy, galaxies and cosmology. And then a working group on fundamental physics. So you can participate in these, uh, in these working groups. Of course, the number of uh, uh, people that can enter this working group is small because uh, uh, we have 100 people for the whole consortium. We have 30 institutes, so we will have uh, on average three, four people per institute. So uh, uh, I think that uh, Spain will have a certain number of people in the, in the science working group. And uh, I think uh, it's up to you how to organize the contribution from the Spanish community. What we were thinking to do in Italy, because for instance, in Italy, we have a, a very large community which is interested to IRIS. Uh, the, the, the whole number of astronomers at ENAF is uh, of the order of a thousand. Then we have a couple of hundred, uh, 300 uh, astronomers in the universities like me. And, uh, to, and the interest is of course much larger than the number of people that can actually enter the science team. So what we could do, what we thinking of doing is to create uh, science teams uh, at the national level. And this science team could be chaired by the people of the, which are part of the IRIS science team so that people, everyone in the country that wants to contribute uh, to, to the project scientifically can work in the science team and uh, the work will be channeled into the IRIS science team by the the representatives in the science team. I think this is, uh, of course, uh, it would be nice to have uh, a larger science team, but that would become uh, almost uh, unmanageable. The way it is now, I think is barely manageable because the way it works is that, as I said, these four working groups, uh, these two four working group uh, have two coordinators each, uh, and uh, these coordinators, eight coordinators, plus the project scientists and the instrument science, they constitute the core science team. So you have the work uh, in, uh, basically, let's, let's consider it a bottom-down approach. So you have a work at the country level, Spain level, science team in Spain. Then you go the you channel your proposals and inputs uh, through your representative in the RS science team in the working groups and then these are channeled through the through the coordinators of the working groups so uh, at the moment for instance there are uh, two uh, i mean this is in phase a there were two uh, spanish astronomers coordinating the working groups um, there was uh, um, Enric Pallier in, uh, for the exoplanets, was the chair of the exoplanets uh, uh, working group. And then uh, I don't remember the name of uh, in, the, in the working group of the stars. Sorry, I'm very, I apologize. Uh, Carlos, uh, Carlos, Carlos Allende? Exactly, Carlos Allende, exactly. Yes, for the, for the working group of stars. And then there were, of course, other people in the working groups themselves. So, but I suggest that this is to, I mean, it's very important, I think, uh, for the project uh, to, uh, to gather the interest of large communities of all 
com the communities of astronomers interested in high resolution spectroscopy in ESO member states, and but and to get the input from everyone, I think that the only way is a bottom up approach like uh, like this one, that is from from the base, from the many, from the communities up to the to the science team. Yeah, uh, that sounds like a very reasonable solution for for the contribution of large communities to to high risk. Hmm. Okay, um, so we have another question, uh, Isabel. Uh, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm sorry if you already said that, but I have been in, in having troubles with my computer. In fact, I've, I've been trying to uh, to reach the Zoom meeting twice. That's no problem. Time. So my, my question is just to be able to, um, I, I come from uh, extra galactic astronomy as well, from AGM mm -hmm. as well. So um, I'd like to see, um, I mean, to, to have an idea of how, what kind of objects we would be able to uh, observe with such a huge spectral resolution, especially for uh, extragalactic astronomy. Okay. So ha have you already said what kind of magnitudes are reachable? Oh, yes. These are, uh, sorry, let me go back uh, with, the, with the slides. Okay, let me go back. Uh, okay, these are simulated absorption spectra from quasars uh, at redshift seven of H, uh, uh, AB of 20, or redshift nine, HAB of 22. So we mm -hmm. can go pretty deep. Uh, regarding extragalactic astronomy, being an extragalactic astronomer myself, I think that uh, the extragalactic uh, science case uh, could be improved uh, a lot uh, in the sense that uh, so far uh, the extragalactic science case deals, uh, but, but this is also the case of many science cases, with uh, an extension of what we can do now with high resolution spectroscopy. So you say, oh, I have a larger telescope, I have these capabilities, what can I do? I just uh, extrapolate what I'm doing now to, to the ELT. I think we should uh, try to think uh, out of the box. And I think we should really start uh, to observe with the high spectral resolution, even galaxies. And uh, for instance, I don't know, I'm looking at outflows in arctic galactic nuclei, just the high spectral resolution will tell you whether these outflows are just uh, uh, uniform, smooth media, or just a collection of small clouds. Uh, the same can be done for the broadline region, just to see, to repeat the experiments done for the, in the past for a few objects. So I think that uh, we can really do something new and important uh, because in extragalactic astronomy, as you know, because of the photon limit, the number of small number of photons, there is extra high resolution spectroscopy is not really uh, very much used. Just for the moment, we are, I just, I mean, just bright quasars uh, are observed. So I think we can do much more, but we should start to think uh, uh, out of the box. I mean, just to try to, to, to try something new. And I think one of the things is would like to, that I would like to do is to try to start using, for instance, Espresso. Trying, of course, in the brightest nearby objects, but then what you can do with Espresso nearby, you can do at higher redshifts with, uh, with Iris. Yeah, but it, I mean, you will always have the compromise of uh, tiny, uh, tiny fields of views, right? Yes, no, no, of course, uh, this is, uh, this is an object, this is a, an instrument for the study of single objects. I mean, it's, it's not an instrument for which you can do uh, large surveys. We discussed in the past uh, of a possibility, which is a, a nice idea, but I mean, it will be something uh, not for construction, but afterwards, that is to combine iris with mosaic. Now in IRIS, there is, I didn't talk about this because in phase A, it came low in, uh, in priority, in science priority, but there is the possibility of having a multi-object uh, mode. That is, uh, if you have uh, 10 large fibers and you have a fiber positioner, you can have, uh, you can have a, a multiplex capability with 10 objects. And then you would have basically a, a resolution with these large fibers of about 10,000. So at the end, you would have like 10 X shooters. 
no? Yet you can, and uh, the nice thing is that uh, since we have the fibers and uh, we, we have a fiber feeding, we could uh, put these fibers in the position of mosaic so that you would have mosaic, which is the multi-object spectrograph, which can observe 200 objects. And of these 200 objects, or I don't remember the number now, but of mm. these 200 objects, 10 would be objects observed, would be feeding the fibers of iris. So you can, you have a field, the faintest object with the mosaic and the brightest an object with, with iris. That would be a very nice, uh, combination and like um, use and flames if I'm not wrong something something like that mm. but of course let's first get uh, iris and mosaic to the telescope and then we'll think about uh, these possible extensions okay thank you you're welcome okay um, uh, how much time do we have for more questions Rene maybe one more or so yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, maybe maybe to to uh, finish summarizing where we are uh, and what it is expected from from the institutions uh, belonging to the consortium. Uh, Alessandro, could you briefly summarize? Um, yeah, the next step. The, 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 okay. The, 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 where we are right now and and what it is expected to be carried out the work that we need to, to carry out uh, in phase B uh, to, to just okay. uh, make everyone understand what, what that means uh, in a phase okay. B for an instrument. Phase B is uh, basically the preliminary design. You just design the instrument and then uh, it's just basically still on paper. Uh, then you have the final design where at the end of the final design, you just freeze the instrument design at the level at which you are ready to, to go for construction. So uh, phase C is the time where, for instance, you start ordering some of the pieces, those that require more time. So I would say that for the next uh, uh, four years, uh, we are at the level of designing the instrument. And then we are starting building it afterwards. So this is what is needed. Design capabilities in phase B and C and, uh, and then uh, integration and construction. Uh, of course, uh, in all these phases, uh, for the point of view of science, there would be uh, a, a revision of the science case because uh, we know that uh, science evolves. So. Uh, for instance, I showed you this community science space over 2013. Uh, many of the things there are already outdated. We need to update them. And uh, probably since we concluded the, the, um, the study, the phase A study in 2018, the science document can be updated. So we need to revise the science case and see what are the uh, interaction between the science team and the system team uh, for uh, uh, what is some design decision uh, are uh, have consequence for science and so on. So we have this interaction to, to, for the design. Of course, the science team must uh, closely interact with the engineers and the system team uh, be, to, be, to ensure that uh, the, the final design of the instrument will allow the science that we want to do. Then again, the science team will have to start working on defining the science program. Because of course, we need to be prepared uh, with, the, with the program. We need the more or less to know what we are going to do with the GTO night that we are getting. So we have to design the science program. So that's more or less what is needed. And uh, what are the steps now? The steps now, we are in the process of uh, finalizing uh, the uh, agreement, the consortium agreement, that is basically the, a memorandum of understanding or a contract or whatever you want to call it, which uh, establishes the consortium. Then we have to finalize uh, the construction agreement, which is the contract that uh, ISO and ENAF as the Lead Technical Institute has to sign. And then after that, we start. Of course, we need to go through the approval by the council, the ISO council. Uh, we hope to be able to go to the uh, June council so that we hope that uh, the construction of IRIS is approved in June. If not, it will be approved in December. In any case, uh, I expect that uh, 
this uh, design phase that is the official start of construction will take place at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. So uh, in the meantime, we will just organize ourselves. We will start organizing ourselves, setting up uh, communication lines, uh, work package managers, people. We will prepare the team. So we will set up the team for the, for the project so that we will be able to start full speed whenever the, the, all, the, all the contracts are signed because we already lost quite a lot of time. I mean, uh, just to clarify, uh, this gap between the end of phase A and the beginning of phase two, is phase B is not the fault of the consortium because the consortium was not ready. We passed the phase B with absolutely no program, with complete success, but it was ISO. Uh, it was not ready for us to start because they had problems with the telescope and other instruments and the other fast light instruments. So they decided they wanted to wait for us to start. So we hope that we lost uh, already a few years, but uh, we hope to we hope to to recover that. I mean. We, we are doing our best to, to avoid uh, losing uh, more time. So as we want to, in any case, we will be ready to start as soon as uh, we, we can officially start. Okay, thanks, Alessandro. Um, I don't see any more questions. This is your last chance to ask Alessandro something about Hyres. So if uh, not, okay. I, I just like to, to say again that, that we will be extremely glad to have a, uh, Alessandro Marconi with us in the in the future. We'll tell you. Thank we'll you. To, I really want will, to come. We will we will have to put together some people at the same time because otherwise we won't have, be able to to. I mean we won't have enough time to have all of you from the Colloquia program. But, but uh, we will make you know, and we'll try to have Absolutely. you. Absolutely. It will be a pleasure to come. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank you. Bye-bye to all you. Thank you. Ciao, Pedro. Ciao, okay, bye. Bye, Isabel. Thank you, Alessandro. Bye. bye. bye.